So we're, we're still talking about the, that interaction, the interplay of our faith living itself out. Um, you know, talking about what the Sabbath worship looks like, uh, talking here about the, what participates in that, that worship. And actually now what we're going to be doing this, so chapter 21, chapter 22, and chapter 23 all have a, a, an intersection. Chapter 23 is on the civil magistrate. So what, what is the, the, the government is supposed to do in light of, of the scriptures? And so the lawful oaths and vows is a crossover between religious worship and the civil magistrate because most often our vows and our oaths uh, have not only spiritual and religious impacts, they actually have uh, political and social impacts. And so we're going to unpack that uh, a little bit, hopefully um, hopefully today, but my guess will probably end up stretching into next week as well. Uh, I, before we dive into the, the confession, I, I want to highlight that there are three types of oaths in the Bible. Uh, there's oaths of witness, oaths of allegiance, and oaths of covenant. And I just want to highlight one passage referencing each of those. Uh, for a, an example of an oaths of witness uh, from Exodus chapter 22, verses 10 through 11. Um, if a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep for him, and it dies or is hurt or is driven away while no one is looking, an oath before the Lord shall be made by the two of them that he has not laid, his, laid hands on his neighbor's property and its owner shall accept it and he shall not make restitution. So here, of course, we're talking about some of the, the uh, laws, the sundry laws that deal with relationships uh, amongst people. And, and of course, this is chapter Exodus 22 is right after Exodus 20, which is talking about the Ten Commandments. And so pretty much the rest of Exodus is takes the Ten Commandments and explodes it, saying, all right, if it, and, and this is in, in the instance of you shall not steal. Uh, that, this is one of the examples of exploding or, or unpacking. Maybe that's a better way of unpacking. What does it mean to not steal? And so the example here, again, is, you know, if, if, you, you know, so if, if a man, if I were to give you my donkey or an ox or a sheep, um, you know, to, to keep for a while or to, to use it, you know, and we, today we'd, we'd probably say, you know, if I, if I was going to let you borrow my chainsaw, you know, we, we, we might use a, borrow the tool or borrow a car. That's a bigger one. You know, if, if you're, if, if I let you borrow, uh, borrow my my fiat for for the day um and and you know it it just suddenly rolls away by you know maybe maybe you forget to put it in neutral or, or leave it in neutral you forget to put up the handbrake or something and it, or it rolls down the hill you know something like that you know essentially what what this is saying is um there was no foul play involved uh, what 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 this oath allows is, is you're calling on the lord you're witnessing before the lord saying it was an accident there was, I didn't mean to, you know, kill the donkey. I didn't mean to lead your sheep astray. Uh, you, you're promising your neighbor, you know, I, I didn't mean to do that. It was an accident. I'm swearing before God. I'm swearing an oath before God that as, you know, I, I, this is, this is, I'm calling God to be a witness that I didn't do this. You know, was it, it was, or I didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. So that's an example of, a, of an oath of witness. And of course, this would be within the legal system, you know, his, uh, that last verse there, uh, its owner shall accept that, that promise and he shall not make restitution. So, you know, if, if that person swears that oath um, and, you know, nothing, he does, he's not cursed by God because he, you know, is faithful and true. He's not lying. He's not giving false witness. Uh, he, he, he rightly, it was an accident. Um, and, you know, he accidentally left the gate open uh, or, or the horse jumped over the gate or something, you know, that it was, it was truly an accident. God didn't curse him. And so the, the owner of the, the animal says, okay, I, I can't seek restitution because it was truly an accident. It goes on and says, you know, if, if it was not an accident, if it was done on purpose, then there is restitution. So there's all, you know, just all of Exodus 22 talks about what's the property rights essentially is what it is. So again, that's the oath of witness. You know, again, you would go like we would go before court if someone was suing you or you were being, you were suing someone, you would go and, you know, bear witness. Hey, this is, this is what happened. Here's the evidence. Uh, this, that's essentially what, what is, is going on here. Uh, another example of an oaths, like I said, is the oaths of allegiance. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 11, verses 4, and then a little bit later in verse 8, uh, now in the seventh year, Jehadiah sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the Karaites 
and of the guard and brought them to him in the house of the Lord. Then he made a covenant with them and put them under oath in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. So verse eight, he says, then you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hands and whoever comes within the ranks shall be put to death and be with the king uh, when he goes out and when he comes in. Essentially, this is, he's just saying to, the, to this, these guardsmen, um, you're swearing your allegiance to protect this young king. Uh, that's what we're talking about here, the king's son, uh, so the heir to the throne. Uh, this is your responsibility. You are, you are swearing, you are swearing an oath of allegiance uh, to protect uh, this king, to protect and, or, you know, we would protect and serve is, is one, is a modern example of, of an oath of allegiance. And a third example is the example of oaths of covenant. Uh, in Jeremiah 38, verses 15 and 16, Jeremiah says to Zedekiah, if I tell you, will you not certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. So there's a, you know, Jeremiah is often um, being, he, the town's folks, the, the city, the, the people, the uh, leaders, they, they don't listen to Jeremiah. They don't want to listen to his words, which one day I'm sure we'll unpack some of Jeremiah's teaching. So he's essentially saying, you're not going to listen to me. But King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret saying, as the Lord lives, who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. So there's a, a covenant promise that he makes with Jeremiah to, to preserve his life even when Jeremiah's prophecy is, is against Jedi and against Jerusalem, uh, which, you know, again, we'll, we'll unpack that. But the, the example here is just, this is an oath of a covenant. So it's not, you know, it's not in the legal system. It's not like an oath of witness, uh, like the first one. Uh, it's not an oath of allegiance because uh, Jedi is the king. Uh, everyone owes allegiance to him. Uh, the prophet is just the prophet of God. Uh, and so in this case, it's, a, it's an oath of covenant because he does it in secret. He says, I'm going to promise that I won't kill you or her. I won't allow them to kill you. Uh, if you know, you just speak the truth. Now, the the problem, hopefully, you, you, maybe I don't know if what's in your mind. Maybe in your mind is Matthew chapter five, verses thirty four and thirty seven. Um, the problem is Jesus very clearly says in that chapter. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of His feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is evil. So how do we reconcile what Jesus says very clearly in Matthew chapter 5? He's, he's in the um, Sermon on the Mount. And, and yet we have this whole section here on lawful oaths and vows. What, what are the Westminster divines doing? Are they ignoring Matthew 5 completely? Well, hopefully we'll come to an answer by the end of, of our lesson, which at this rate will probably be next week. So uh, just keep that in mind and, I, and, I'll, and I'll make reference to it again a little later. So that's uh, the main thing we're going to be talking about here in Oves is um, how what makes an oath lawful before God, especially in light of the question or in light of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. Any questions before we dive into the first article? All right, so the first article reads, a lawful oath is a part of religious worship, wherein upon just occasion, the person swearing solemnly calleth God to witness what he asserteth or promiseth and to judge him according to the truth or falsehood of what he sweareth. So the, a lawful oath does two things. It calls God to bear witness, and it calls God to judge truthfulness. That's what makes a lawful oath, is that we're calling upon God to bear witness to what we're doing, to what we're saying, and to judge us according to the truthfulness of, of what we say or what we do. Uh, so, and, and I'll unpack all that. Uh, that's pretty much what this whole chapter is unpacking is that, that verse there or that section, you know, how God is calling us or we call God to bear witness and we call God to judge the truthfulness of our statements. Um, the person swearing solemnly calleth God to witness. That's the first one there. So what, what we are saying when we, uh, you know, when you think about our, our, 
common conversations. Uh, sometimes we might say some things like, uh, oh, uh, I, I swear by on my honor. I swear on my honor. You know, what, what are we saying when we say that? And we're saying, you can trust me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reputable person. I'm an honorable person. You, you, can, you can trust me. Uh, we, you know, we might say something like that. Or, or you know, people jokingly or, or uh, spitefully say, well, I swear on my mother's life. I, I, I didn't do that. What, what are you trying to say? Well, when you say something like that, you're saying, you, you know, it, I promise that I, you know, I didn't do that thing so much so that I swear that, you know, my mother's life is on the line. If it's untrue, then her life could be taken. You know, essentially that's what, what we're saying there. Um, what God wants us to do when we're looking at our lawful oaths, what makes a lawful oath, is that we're to call on God's name, but not in a profane way. So when we say things like, oh, I swear my honor, I swear my mother's name, or you know, whatever we might say, that's a profane way of saying it. And actually, that's kind of what Jesus gets to when he says, you know, uh, don't swear by heaven or by earth or, or by Jerusalem. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12, uh, God very clearly says, you shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So God doesn't prevent oath or prevent swearing by his name. He doesn't say you, you shouldn't do it. He's saying, don't swear falsely by my name. Uh, don't profane God's name. Because if we say something like, as God is my witness, and then we go and tell a lie, what are we doing? Well, we're essentially profaning God's name. We're, we're using saying, God, oh God, you're my witness, and then I'm going to go and tell you a lie. Well, that says... One, I have no respect for God or his power, um, or, or, and two, I want to profane his holy name. And so God says, you shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane my name. We are calling God's holy righteousness to bear witness. Again, God doesn't say, don't swear at all. He says, don't swear falsely by my name. And so the second thing it does, so again, we're calling God to bear witness. We also call God to judge the truthfulness when we, when we have a lawful oath. And so the Westminster Confession says, and to judge him according to the truth or falsehood of what he sweareth. Um, so for instance, let me, let me show you here in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Uh, here, God's judgment is, is pleaded for in this case. Um, so if a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, and he comes and takes an oath before your altar in this house, then hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, punishing the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him accordance to, according to his righteousness. And so we see here that the, the call, and this is you know, within the prayer of, of, um, of Solomon when he's praying for what God will do in, in his new house. Um, and of course, he's talking about the temple there. Uh, if a man does sin against a neighbor, so if a person sins, and, and again, we're, we're talking about essentially a, a court of law type thing. If, if, if uh, you, you do something against your neighbor uh, and you make an oath that you, know, you, you either didn't do it on purpose like it was an accident, or you didn't actually do it, it may have been someone else. What we're doing is we're calling God, coming before God's throne, and, in, and asking him to judge the truthfulness of that statement. Was it really an accident? God will, will reveal it. Was it something, was this person lying? Well, God will reveal it. And, and again, Solomon's prayer here is that God will punish the wicked by bringing his way, the wicked's way on his own head, and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. So God knows the truthfulness of the oath, of the statement. And God is being called to, to judge it. And Paul does this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. He says, For God is my witness, how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Um, here again, Paul's starting his letter to the Philippians. He's in prison. He knows very much the court system in and out because he's been uh, being tried and he's, he's again standing, uh, hopefully going before Felix soon. And so God is, he say, for God is my witness, how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. He's essentially swearing, you know, God is my witness. I'm calling God to, to, to judge me 
that I love you, that I, I'm so filled with affection for you. And of course, Paul was. Uh, Paul was deep. And he does it again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. For we never came with flattering speech. He's talking about himself and, and, his, um, and the other apostles, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Uh, so there he even calls, you know, again, in the context of the first century, uh, there was a, such a thing as traveling philosophers. Uh, today, that seems really weird to us. I'm not really sure. I'm trying to think of, you know, we, we might go to a, a concert or something, you know, as we would go to a concert or a play. Well, the ancient Greeks would go and listen to philosophers, uh, and you would pay a philosopher to, to, to tell you good things, or, or you would pay a philosopher to, you know, just uh, uh, philosophize on things that, that are pleasing to you. Uh, and, and if you didn't like what the philosopher was saying, you could not pay him, and then he would, you know, go away. And essentially what Paul here is saying is, God is my witness. We, we weren't doing this for greed. You know, we, we didn't come and preach to you what you wanted to hear so you could pay us so we can get rich. Uh, God is bearing witness to that, that we, we came and we preached the truth regardless of, you know, how much you gifted to us, which, you know, the churches did help support Paul. Uh, but he's saying we didn't do it for that reason. We, we preached the gospel. God is our witness because we, we never came to you flattering speech. So that's what we're doing when we, when we talk about um, the, what a lawful oath is. Now, it's interesting, and, and I, I, I didn't have time to really unpack this, the first sentence here. A lawful oath is a part of religious worship. Did you all catch that? part when we, when we first started. Um, the Westminster Confession never goes on and actually unpacks what that looks like or how that, that p- takes part. Uh, clearly in, in their mind, or at least from what I can see, in their mind, when, when you take a lawful oath, you're doing it before God. And just as you know, we talked in the previous chapter on what religious worship is, religious worship is everywhere. It's not contained to a building. It's not contained to a particular time. You know, there is a certain time where we all gather and, and worship together. You know, the Lord's Day, Sunday, you know, we, we set that time apart for Sabbath worship of God. But if we, as we saw, we talked about prayer and we talked about how every day we are to be worshiping God. It seems that the Westminster Divines are connecting the previous chapter with this one and saying that a lawful oath is part of our worship religious worship of God. So wherever we are making a lawful oath, we are engaging in the worship of God. Just as whenever we're doing prayer, whether we're praying privately in our homes, with our families, or in church, we are participating in the worship of God. I think that's what's going on again. They don't really unpack that fully uh, here, but it, it seems very clear, again, in the Westminster Divine's minds, that when there is a public oath being made, it's part of religious worship. That's an interesting thing to think about whenever we think about the public oaths that are made in our country, right? How many times, you know, police officers are sworn in. It's a swearing in ceremony. Or or when the president is sworn into office. All that, you know, those folks have in their mind Samuel Rutherford who is in this assembly, not all of them, but some of them had Samuel Rutherford in their mind, who is at the Westminster Assembly in 1643. Samuel Rutherford is one early philosopher and political philosopher and Presbyterian minister. Folks like uh, uh, John Witherspoon, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, had Samuel Rutherford in his head, probably. Um, you know, so there, we get these connections from you know, uh, all these things. So is, did they see whenever the swearing-in ceremony, was that part of religious worship? Maybe, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't think many of them were following the Westminster Confession in 1776. So I, I can't say for sure. Uh, but very clearly, again, the Westminster Conf- divines have in their mind that the lawful oath is part of religious worship. Um, and again, I think it's going back to this notion that wherever there is lawful worship, whenever there's lawful prayer, and whenever there's a lawful oath, it is part of our religious worship of God. Any questions before we move on to Article 2? Well, when you go to the court, if you serve on a jury, Mm -hmm. you have to take an oath. Mm -hmm. That's another example. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Mm -hmm. I've done it many times, but I never thought of it as a religious. As a religious, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and again, I think it's because, you know, we, well, we don't, 
not many of us are reading the Westminster Confession today and, um, and thinking of it in that, in that way. Um, so I definitely, yeah. <laughs> I, I had never thought of it either until I read this. I was like, oh, well, I'm not really sure. Again, and I, and I looked up that reference. I'm a little bit warm, so I'm going to open this one. I looked up that reference, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. I'm not really sure. It didn't, it didn't really make sense, the connection to me. So I, I'm, I need to look. I need to dive into that a little bit further. Um, you know, that lawful oath is part of religious worship. It's, I'm probably way off base here, but we've been watching The Crown. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't know this until we watched that, but with them thinking that the queen or the royal family was divinely mm-hmm. chosen or mm-hmm. appointed, is that kind of the same? Absolutely, thing? yeah. And certainly within the Westminster Divine, because again, when we're thinking about the situation here, this is not just a religious document. This is a political document, too, that's supposed to be drawn up. This, the Westminster Confession of Faith was supposed to replace the Book of Common Prayer in the, in the Anglican Church. Um, you know, again, the politics of the situation, the, the Puritans, the Presbyterians, they had gained power in Parliament. That's how they were able to call this assembly together in 1643 to, to, to draw this, because they wanted to give the Church of England a new prayer book, a new worship book. And that includes in it the, the lawful oath of the, of the ruler, of the, the king, being sworn into that, that office of, of king. And so certainly, and, and, and I mean, that is true. When, whenever, I, mean, I assume there'll be maybe within my lifetime a new king, queen's pretty old, uh, and she's, she's pretty strong still. I don't know what she is, 90-something. Um, but, you know, she's not going to last forever. And, and whenever the next heir is, is crowned, it will be part of a religious service. That's why she was crowned in, whatever it was, 53 in Westminster, 52? <laughs> she was crowned in Westminster, uh, Westminster uh, uh, Abbey, God, I guess I was, yeah, the Westminster Abbey, you know, in the church. And it was part, and that's why the, the um, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury is the one who does it, because he's the, he's the highest office or the next highest office in the church. Technically, the, the, the king is the highest office in the Church of England, um, but the next person is the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so it is part of a religious service. She took that oath in the church. And it's all part of that, that ceremony. Now, I don't know what it will look like when the next one's, I mean, that was, wow, you know, how old are you? <laughs> that was, that, that's how long ago it was. I mean, that yeah. part of it, yeah. they did, because they showed coverage on TV, yeah. but not that part. Because yeah. Because that was the, you know, God kind of comes down and touches yeah. you and all that, I don't know. Yeah. After the coronation was like a year later. She became queen in 52. Yeah. The coronation was like a year later. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's, so it'll be interesting to see what it, but yes, I definitely think the Westminster Divines have that in their mind uh, because, again, their, one of their goals is to rewrite the, the Book of Common Worship for the, for the Church of England. Yeah. Good question. Not, well, we had not started watching it back when we started this. Yeah. So that, that was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right, move on to the article two then. The name of God only is that by which men ought to swear, and therein it is to be used with all holy fear and reverence. Therefore, to swear vainly or rashly by that glorious and dreadful name, or to swear at all by any other thing, is sinful and to be abhorred. Yet, as in matters of weight and moment, an oath is warranted by the word of God under the New Testament as well as under the Old. So a lawful oath being imposed by lawful authority in such matters ought to be taken. All right, so we need to unpack this uh, particular article. First of all, it makes reference that the name of God is only, the name of God only is to be which men ought to swear and therein is to be used with holy fear and reverence. So again, your own, a lawful oath is only to be made in the name of God. So we are, again, God, 
We're not supposed to swear falsely by God's name, but we are to swear truly by God's name. And when we swear by that name, we, we keep in mind the weightiness of that name, the holiness of that name. And so we do swear with all, uh, with all fear and reverence. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, you shall fear only the Lord your God. You shall worship him and swear by his name. Um, so there even Moses is telling us that uh, when we worship God, it's only in his name. The one who we fear and reverence is only God because it's a, of who he is. And we swear by his name and his name alone, which I do think is what Jesus touches on. And I'll unpack that when we get there. But I do think that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 5. And so the divine say to, to swear vainly or rashly or by any other thing is sinful and to be abhorred. Um, we're not to swear by anything. And of course, Jesus says, don't swear by uh, heaven, don't swear by earth, don't swear by Jerusalem, don't even swear by your own name. Because you, you know, we, we talk about our, my honor, I do things. That's contrary to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. We don't have the power. You know, the example Jesus says there is you, don't, you, you can't control when your hair turns gray, is essentially what, what he said. I'm paraphrasing. You can't control when that happened. You, you can mask it. <laughs> you, you can mask it, but you can't control when it, when it starts happening. Uh, or you can't stop it from happening either. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, the, the point that Jesus is making is if the, when you make a lawful oath, you can only swear by that thing which actually has the power to judge. His point is the earth doesn't have that power. The heavens don't have that power. Jerusalem definitely doesn't have that power. And you yourself don't have that power. Well, especially, but how can you gauge your own truthfulness? There's something wrong about that, which is why, you know, when, we, when you hire someone, you often ask for letters of recommendation, right? or references from someone, you want to take a person's faith value, and we should, we, we, want to be, we want to be trustworthy of people, but we still want to know that that person is indeed trustworthy. So we get letters of recommendation, we, we ask references, and at job search, you, you, at, you call the former employee, employer, hey, is, is Joe a good worker? Is, is, is Alice really, a, a, you know, she, she really able to do these things? We want to, we want to make sure. Because the truth is, we can't swear by ourselves, by our, by our own, on our own self. We don't have the power to judge. It, we really need to go up a level. And that's the point here, is that the highest level that God wants us to swear by is his name. Because God is the ultimate source of power and authority. And of course, God is the only source that can met out true judgment and true justice, which is why, again, to swear vainly or rashly or by any other thing is sinful. We can't swear by heaven or earth or Jerusalem or on our own name or on my mother's life or whatever we want to say. That's sinful because the only way that we can rightly swear is by the name of God. Zechariah chapter 5 verses 3 through 4 says, then he said to me, uh, talking to Zechariah, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts. So there's God telling Zechariah that he, God, is the one who will purge according to the swear, according to the, the truthfulness of the oaths that were made. He continues in verse 4, And it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name, and it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timber and stones. Of course, God's talking about his, his curse, his judgment, falling upon those who swear falsely. Uh, again, these are he's talking here about those who, who made us an oath and either lied in their oath, or they didn't swear by God's name. They did it, oh, well, it's on my honor, or you know, by Jerusalem. God takes seriously the oaths that we take when they are sworn in his name. Because to do so any otherwise, any other way is a sin. 
An oath is warranted by the word of God under the New Testament as well as under the Old. So here, again, the Westminster Divines are uh, trying to understand, I think they're trying to get to Matthew chapter 5. They get there eventually, but uh, the, the referencing that they talk to or they point to is Paul's example of making oaths in the New Testament. So for instance, we, lit, we talk about the other two in Philippians chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians where he says, God is my witness, I you know, do these things. Here, Paul does the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23, but I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. Um, again, this is talking about the situation of what's going on in Corinth. If uh, Paul were to have come, the church probably would have been uh, uh, decimated, would have been persecuted. And so Paul is, is saying, you know, I didn't, essentially the, the concern in this letter is, you know, people think that Paul has abandoned the church in Corinth. And Paul is telling them, no, I didn't abandon you. I call God as my witness that to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. I, I, I didn't come not because I don't love you, I don't care for you. I didn't come because I wanted to protect you. And so now I'm writing this letter to you, essentially what he's saying there. He's, a, he's swearing by God, he's calling God again as a witness on his soul that to bear truthfulness or, or witness to the truthfulness of his statement. And again, Paul does this in several places. And that's the point that the Westminster divines get to is that Paul does it. Now, here's the question, and this is always a question that we need to ask. If Paul does something, does that always mean we can do the same thing? And you know, that, that you, you we'll have to unpack that some other time because Paul does some pretty uh, apostolic things. You know, Paul raises people from the dead. Uh, Paul heals people by the word of God. Are we always able to do that? Not really. Uh, Paul speaks with apostolic authority. He, he is writing the word of God and he knows this. Paul is aware that when he is writing these letters to the church, he is writing what the Holy Spirit has inspired in him. And he's telling them, I'm telling you these things. Can we speak with such authority? Maybe, maybe no. I don't know. We'll have to unpack you know, each situation. So just because Paul does it, does that mean we can? Well, the Westminster Divines clearly think so. They say if Paul does it in several occasions, he, he calls God as, to bear witness to his soul, then this is, a, this is attestation in the New Testament that we too can lawfully swear uh, by God's name. And of course, in the Old Testament, we see many examples. Uh, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So this is very clearly a, a, an Old Testament commandment. This is uh, very clearly what, has, what is to be done. And of course, you know, this is true, extended even into the New Testament. Paul encourages us to, to be truthful in our words. You know, if a man makes a vow to the Lord and he takes that oath, don't violate it. Do according to the oath. Follow the contract. Don't break the contract. Uh, and, and I think that that's true when we think of our society today. If we hire a, 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 someone to come and do some work on our house and you sign that contract, we get really upset when that contract, when the, the, the details of the contract aren't, aren't followed through, right? Whether, you know, it involves cleanup or doing it for the set price or, you know, whatever it is or, for, or you know, the set duration. If it's written down in contract, legally it's written in stone. And to do what is opposite or, or to fall short of what's in that contract is sinful. And, of course, can lead to things like suing and other stuff like that. Um, we got 15 minutes. Anything I can... Any questions on Article 2? All right. So now we're going to move on to Article 3. Whosoever taketh an oath ought duly to consider the weightiness of so solemn an act, and therein to avouch nothing but what he is fully persuaded is the truth. Neither may any man bind himself by oath to anything but what is good and just, and what he believeth so to be, and what he is able and resolved to perform. Yet is it a sin to refuse an oath 
touching anything that is good and just being imposed by lawful authority. So there are several things here. This essentially means we have to be persuaded in our lawful oath taking. Uh, consider the weightiness of so solemn an act. He is fully persuaded is the truth. Right? So whenever you take it, you now that's a solemn act. You're vouched there nothing, but what is fully uh, persuaded is the truth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, Paul says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So whenever we are, are taking our, or, and even in light of the previous uh, article there, you know, uh, so lawful enough being opposed by lawful authority uh, in such matters ought to be taken. So when we take this oath, we have to remember that this is a weighty matter. We're doing it in God's name. Okay, that's a weighty thing. The same fear and reverence we have when we come before God's name and worship is the same fear and reverence that we need to consider the weightiness of the oath that we're making before God. And so when we make this oath before our God, who we fear and who we revere, we need to be fully persuaded of the truthfulness of that thing, of that statement. And so, you know, if there is any doubt in your mind, whether, you know, we'll, we'll go back to the, to the example of, of borrowing my, my fiat, because I think that's a good example that fits in here. Um, you know, if, if you forgot to, to pull up the, e, the, the handbrake and it, and it slides down the hill and crashes, well, we need to be fully persuaded that you're really not at fault. But are you really not at fault because you forgot to pull up the e-brake? You know how cars work. You know how gravity works. And, and so, you know, if, if, if you know, I, I did this to, to someone's car and, and, I, and I think about it and I, you know, I thought of saying, well, I didn't do it, it was an accident. But then I really consider the weightiness of what my words are. Did I really not do it? Is it really not my fault? I didn't pull up the e-brake. Uh, I didn't put it in gear. I parked on a slope and I didn't turn the wheel, you know, towards the curb. You know, all the stuff they teach you in, in driver's ed. Am I really not at fault? Well, the truthfulness of the matter is I am at fault <laughs> because I, I, didn't, I didn't take the, the necessary precautions. It was an accident. It wasn't on purpose. It wasn't malicious, but it was still your fault. You, I, I still did it. I did it. And so again, that's, that's the whole point of this particular article is we need to consider the weightiness of our words. If we're, if we're swearing, and again, you know, I'm talking, could be talking between people, but you know, if, if I, you know, were be dragged to the court and say, I didn't do it. It was an accident. Well, the judge would, would look at that. Well, did you take driver's ed? You, you clearly borrowed the, the car, so you know how to drive a manual transmission. You, you know what a, an e-brake does, the parking brake. You, know, you, you, know, you have the knowledge and all that stuff. There's really no true ignorance in that setting. And so the judge would say, it was an accident, but you still need to pay for it or something like that. You know, there's still, and so there's this recognition that the, tr the weightiness of our words matter. We need to consider that before we you know, jump right into swearing something, even swearing it by God's name. You know, again, the truthfulness, the truth is it was an accident. I could swear by God's name that I didn't mean to do it. It, it wasn't malicious. That's a true statement. But was it truly an accident? Was it truly, did, did I truly not know how to do it? Like the children throw something. I didn't mean to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I didn't know what that, I did that. I, uh, my dad had a, a dart set in, uh, in a room in, next to our garage. And, uh, and I didn't know that hitting a dart on the tire would, <laughs> poke. I didn't know. And I was, you know, childish and I found out real quick, real quick. So yeah, so there's, you know, there, <laughs> there, there's the weightiness of, of our, of our words matter. Um, that's the point of this section here. Um, the next sentence says, uh, so an oath to anything, but what is good and just and what he is able to and resolve to perform. So neither, you know, you can't bind yourself to anything but what is good and just. So again, when we, when we think about something that when we're swearing something, we're swearing this oath, we can't swear to do something that is not good or something that is evil or swear to do something that is unjust. 
Just because you're swearing it in God's name, and, and the next article will talk about this, we'll unpack it a little further, but we, we can't swear to do something that is evil. We can't promise to, you know, just because they say, you know, you need to swear, you can't promise to do evil. You can't promise to do something that is unjust. And you can't promise to do something you can't actually do. You, you, you have, if you're going to swear to do something, you have to remember, you have to do what you are able to do. And I'll jump back to Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. We, we looked at it previously. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And, and later on, we'll talk about pledges and, and vows. Um, if you are unable to do the, the thing that you're about to swear to do, don't do it. Yeah, that, that's a, where they, when they talk about pledging, when they talk about uh, vows and, and, and giving money to God or of, your, of your wealth, the, the prophets go on and say, it's better for you not to even pledge. Don't, don't swear an oath that you're going to give God your offering and then come you know, and say, oh, well, I couldn't actually do it or uh, I, I, over, I didn't budget right. You know, if, if you don't think that you can afford don't even swear it. Don't even make that promise. Because when you promise something, you're, you're resolving yourself to do it, to do what it is. And so that's the point of this lawful oath here is you need to be aware of your own limitations, essentially what it's saying here. When you're going to swear whatever it is you're swearing before God, because by law, you're swearing before the judgment of God, you have to do it. You, you have to, otherwise you'll, you'll receive the curse. And the flip side of that is also true, yet it is a sin to refuse an oath touching anything that is good and just. And so if you know this, this oath is true and good and just, we cannot refuse it. Going back to Exodus chapter 22, again, using that example of, of the donkey, you know, if a man gives his neighbor a donkey you know, and he keeps it or he, and he dies or he you know, drives away, an open for the Lord shall be made of the two of them that he has not laid his hands on his neighbor's property. And again, its owner shall accept it, and he shall not make restitution. So if, if it's a true thing, that, that last sentence is what I wanted to highlight there. So if, if again, using the example of the donkey, if you know, I borrowed your, your donkey, and it jumped over my fence, and it got chased by a wolf, and fell off a cliff and died, uh, it jumped, it did it. You know, I, I, I wasn't negligent, I didn't do anything, I did everything within my power, within my knowledge to keep that donkey safe, and yet it still escaped and died. And I swear before God that I didn't do it, and God sees and, and the judge bears witness and says that's a true statement, then the, the owner shall accept it and he shall not make restitution. The owner has to accept, he cannot refuse a lawful oath that is touching on something that is good and just. Um, so there's no appeals court in, in ancient Jerusalem. If God says it, if the judge says it's so, it's so. You're done. Leave it. Go on. We cannot refuse an oath that touches on anything good. Um, that's the article. I, I think we'll stop there because I've got several things before we go on to article four. Any questions on, on anything we've talked about so far? Question of wording of that last sentence. Yeah. It's like a question to me, yet is it a sin? Should that be yet it is a sin? That's just the old way of, of you. I think if I remember grammar correctly, the verb has to precede the whatever. I don't know grammar. So yeah, I, <laughs> I think that, yeah, I, clearly I didn't do very well. I think that's what in, in old English, the verb has to come before whatever the it is sent, you know. And so I, it's just the way it's constructed. It's not a question. We certainly would, wouldn't say it that way today. This is an example of how language changes over time. Yeah, if I were to rewrite it today, I would say, yet it's a sin to refuse an oath. Just very, you know, simply it is. Um, apparently back then, is comes before it. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again so much for um, giving to us the, the um, Westminster Confession. And uh, Lord, it's, it's something that we need to unpack and, and wrestle through. But Lord, ultimately, it is not 
your word. Lord, we must rely fully and be persuaded completely by your word in scripture. And Lord, I pray and hope that as we continue to understand and unpack the Westminster Divine's uh, understanding of what a lawful oath is, Lord, I pray that we are always remembering what it is that you call us to do and what it is that you are calling us to say with our words, with our actions, uh, and to live out your truth, the truth, the truth of your giving. So Lord, I pray that as we will continue this next week, that you help us to to better understand uh, where the Westminster Divines are coming from. Lord, we pray all this in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen.